Okay, we are live. So hello, hello everyone, and and welcome to today's uh, Terra Mechanics Byte in the ISTVS Digital uh, Event Series. Uh, I'm your host Massimo Martelli, and I'm I'm back hosting after a while. And thanks to Andres and Mohit for filling in for me in in the past events. So as usual, I would like to invite you uh, to drop in a short introduction uh, in the session chat uh, and use the session Q&A tab uh, to type questions for our speaker. After the presentation, you, you're all invited to join the live discussion by clicking the blue button at the top right uh, to share your audio and video. And a moderator uh, will admit you in the, um, in the live conversation. So uh, today's talk uh, is on uh, GIS for modeling off-road mobility. And our speaker is Dr. George Mason. George uh, is the US National Secretary of ISTVS and research professor at the Center for Advanced Vehicle Systems of the Mississippi State University. His research expertise lies in mobility research related to military areas, encompassing geospatial analysis, discrete element modeling of soils, vehicle terrain interaction, and geostatistics studies on disturbed and undisturbed soils. Uh, I hope, uh, George, I s summarized well enough your, your long bio and uh, when you are ready, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Maxwell. Uh, I, I appreciate the introduction. Um, the, this talk today will take about 20 minutes and, and we'll leave about 20 minutes for uh, question Q&A. So I shouldn't extend over an hour <laughs> for this brief. Um, it, it's uh, the area of uh, the area we're going to talk about is geographical information systems. I, I have about ten years with the private sector in the U.S. and uh, thirty with feds, and another ten with the state. And during that time, I've had to work with GIS systems to support analysis of the of the ground movement. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, my experience, and, and and maybe have during the Q and A have some. Uh, other folks, it's, it's basically a learning experience as, as we go through here. The work we I did primarily was revolved around the, the legacy NATO reference mobility model. I re realize there's a NRMM NG that's uh, standing up, and also um, there is a uh, MAT, which is a, a version of NRMM that was extended to the HPC, it's used at ERTC. Often this is used to compare the forms of two, two or more vehicles. To do that, you have a uh, tractor force speed curve that represents the vehicle's movement. You can measure this physically on a dyno, and you can look at the force of the wheel at different speeds. This can be reduced by soil, slope, vegetation override. and also, the speed itself can be constrained by surface roughness, visibility, maneuver, and braking. The intersection of these would be the speed that's reported by the model. Now, if you're running something like MAVS or Anvil or, or a, a model that's uh, giving you real-time performance, anything in this hash line could be a operating envelope or a speed that you may be achieving. Uh, often the model in our memo will report the maximum speed unless you tell it to do differently. So that's at 100% throttle, which is, but that, that'll give you the maximum speed, but there's certainly a, a speeds in that. But each polygon on a map will have this information as an output from the model and, and often returned in forms of a reason code. And it's one or more of these factors. To get to that, uh, in the early days, we would take, um, and it hadn't changed a lot, we would take 
things like soil strength, slope, roughness, obstacles, vegetation, visibility, these individual factors, factor maps and overlay them and then add them together. Um, sometimes called intersection of, of polygons, but they, they would create a, a series of attributes for each polygon. Now on, on the right hand side, you're seeing different factor maps and they're, they're for vegetation and surface roughness. We would overlay these and add them together and basically make one composite polygon for each of these that have attributes listed and, and use those as inputs to the model and create an output of speed. Creating these maps in the old days in, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s consisted of a, of a light table and a, some polyurethane film that went over a map and, and we would draw up the polygons in the regional areas and, and then digitize it and each map would be a factor map that would be added together. This is an old VMS system that was uh, pretty nice at the time and this digitizing effort could get somebody a good bit of money, you know, uh, the, the court was always looking for somebody to digitize maps and, and um, this slowly went out the way as we began to get more realistic terrain data digitally. I'll, I'll show some examples of that later on. But in the early days, this is this is how everything worked. Uh, we would we would take a, um, for example, for elevation data, we would take a radial distortion or, or, or the use of um, I've done this before, wore a pair, pair of glasses and looked at two different maps. And this is a map on the left and right. It's a, it's a map of a very similar area that's offset slightly. And and it, you, from that, you can create raised contours and, and digital elevation uh, from a contour map. Each raster or say every meter on the map becomes a, a elevation point. Uh, the shuttle went up with, with what was called the SRM and created, um, did something very similar, but they did it in a more automated format and created these elevation maps, which I think were at 30 meters for the SRM study. It's often called DTED, D Digital Elevation Terrain Data. This is um, the first factor map you would work with. Even though you have elevation data, deriving slope is a, is a uh, little bit of a convoluted process. And the left left is rise over run, which is a simple derivation of slope. If you've got two points on the ground, if you have multiple points, you end up with a, a, a plane. And with a plane, you're going to have an aspect. Uh, you'll have a maximum slope, minimum slope. And and you might paint these. Uh, uh, this, uh, we were creating these three D drawings back in the late eighties. But the speed you would get out of something like NRMM for a given polygon on this map might be a maximum, minimum, and average speed based upon the different slopes you would encounter on this polygon. Of course, these are tens, the uh, triangulated great network. It, a ten is so. This is a somewhat misrepresentation. It's it's not a, uh, it, it, um, but as 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 we went forward, these are some of the GIS systems I've been familiar with. Um, QGIS is you, it's going to be your non-proprietary uh, GIS system that you can get today, and we uh, we've had a good bit of success doing things like co-creating in, in GI and QGIS. It was derived from something called GRASS. GRASS was created by Searle, one of the core labs, and, and GRASS is still out there. And of the course, there's ArcGIS, which is, is more familiar to folks and has a lot of standards. During the early 80s, late 70s, the core did a lot of integration work with ArcGIS, and, and a lot of the standards that were derived from the shape files come from those early efforts. There are different um, different GIS systems that might work with better with satellite imagery, such as ERDES and um, XV. I've used XV before, and it's also a freeware. 
I did some work with Landsat imagery on XV and actually wrote some algorithms for fuzzy neural nets to, to derive roads in, in this area. In, in that case, it was a Landsat imagery of Russia. And Russia had a habit, particularly in the 80s, of not defining their roads very well. And so using a combination of photo, photos and training on the Landsat imagery, which was seven channels, I could use XV and extract the road sections. And on the far right is something called uh, Viz 5D. It's been around for a little bit. I think University of Wisconsin puts it out. And it's, it's an excellent tool when you get into more exotic 3D uh, and temporal variations in terrain. So uh, in the simplest form, there's a, there's a shape file. Um, shape files usually consist of, of three different files, I guess, a raster would actually be simpler than this, but this is uh, the, the what was coming out of the 80s and, and was the standard. It's uh, you end up with a DBF file that looks like a spreadsheet. Then you end up with a shape file and an SHX file, which are both can t tell where the polygons are located and give a, a, a corners of the polygon. So Doing it in this format, if you want to change the projection system, that is, if you want to go from WGS84 to another projection system, all you have to do is change the shape file on SSH, 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 H, <laughs> shape, well, these last two files here. And um, uh, the, there's multiple projection systems. WGS84 is the one most folks use, and, and that has to do with how the planes were established because the, the earth is not flat and you have to have some free way to paste a, a picture on top of a map. There are also uh, additional formats you'll run across as uh, KMZ, KML. I, I, I've used those a good bit and I, I really like them. They, they they can be sent to a sponsor or customer. In this case, um, this was a sole moisture overlay in Afghanistan. And once the KM KMC and KML files are sent, you can send them by email or other, and, and KMC is a compressed form of KML. KML, you can actually look at it in a text editor. Um, it's very easy to, to uh, send it to somebody and, and the projection systems uh, link to the Google Earth file so it shows up relatively easy as long as they have Google Earth on their end. Uh, GeoTIFFs, JPEGs, and, and PNG files are, are different uh, formats to each one of them um, are usually used with raster images. So if you're doing work with Landsat or Landsat imagery or something else, you, you can use those files pretty easily. So while I have the folks here, I'm not sure how many folks we have online, a few minutes. Um, I wanted to go through an example, and I, I'm not sure the easiest way to do this, but it, on your end, if you typed up HP TTPS, and I kind of suggested if you got a little time, uh, and, and click in worldview.earthdata.nasa.gov, you should bring up this site right here. So what, what I'm trying to do here is sh show a, a very simple uh, way of bringing up some GIS data. Now you're bypassing the, the um, you're bypassing the, the digitizing tablets and everything, but you're coming in directly in and you're pulling up GIS data from a source that has some relatively good information. If you go into a worldview, and you click into floods down here, it's going to give you some information about moisture content on the surface of the earth, which is a nice feed into mobility. You can convert that relatively easily to soil strength if you have a soils map. USDA, uh, there's other sources, uh, FAO from the United Nations has some soils maps out and you bring that in and tie it together with this flood map. If you bring up the flood map, it's going to give you a menu 
one of them is going to be uh, soil moisture equivalents. If you click on that soil moisture equivalents, you can add that layer to, to map, underlying map. In this case, when I click on it, it's, it's going to give me this list of items. One of them, soil moisture for SMAP is the one I, I would be interested in. Uh, so SMAP is soil moisture active passive. It's a satellite system that was deployed about 15 years ago and had both an active and passive radar content into it. And you click on the root zone because there's multiple layers. You have subsurface moisture and surface moisture. And the root zone is, is um, often the one I'll key on because it gives up. Uh, but there is reasons you might want to look at subsurface moisture. Once you click on that, it, it provides a, a nice clean map for, in this case, this is um, December 16th, 2021, of soil moisture variations on the earth. So, so if you were interested in, say, a study in Brazil, and you were looking at soil moisture variations, you would next click on the on the right hand corner there's a camera there you would click on that camera it gives you an option to take a snapshot and the resolution and it, it gives you options to, to include geotiff and in, in ping files but geotiff it, it can be imported into arcgis or any other gis tool you define the region of interest and you export it and then you bring it into your ArcGIS and you convert this to, to soil strength if that's what you're interested in. You have your slope map from your SRM or, or DTED data that's also available online. And with that, you have slope, soil strength. There are other factors in worldview. I, I've used AMSR E, which gives indications of vegetation. And I've taken that and derived stem spacing for inputs into NRMM. So you can almost get everything you need out of worldview from satellite imagery that's relatively real time for any place in the world. Um, this gives an overview of, of what I did to, to convert it to soil strength. The core had a soil strength map is still out there um, that they give real time measurements, but for whatever reason, about 30 days ago, they they put a um, password protect on it. So now you probably have to have a contract with the core to get to it. With, with that said, you don't need that soil strength map. You can create your own. You pull in FAO or other some other soils map. Now, there is entire societies built around developing world soils maps, but you can bring in your, this is Air Force Weather Agency, but <clears throat> soil moisture and grib format, but the SMAP will give you this. Uh, actually, in my opinion, more accurate, but Air Force Weather Agency does use <clears throat> um, a series, a sparse network of weather stations. These MET stations uh, are listed under the World Meteorology Organization, WMO and connecting between the MET stations and the satellite imagery supposedly gives you a little bit more accurate data. But the SMAP, I believe, uses those MET stations to validate its information. <clears throat> but you, you convert these to a shape file. If you're working with ArcGIS, you, you, you clip out your areas of interest, you assign your soil properties, and then you convert volumetric moisture to gravimetric because you, you have to do it in terms of weight. And then you, you compute the soil strength for each of the soil classes and you re regenerate a soil strength model for that area of interest. So that's basically what the core was doing on those maps they were generating earlier. Um, this is an example of Afghanistan, Kabul, 
uh, soil moisture map we generated. These are speed maps that were the final product. This was for Humvee and an MRAP. We're doing a comparison of the performance of the two vehicles in the area. And you see, there's a little bit more blue on the Humvees, just showing the Humvee I was operating a little better in that area and region than the MRAP, which is what you expect. So in this case, we're using LIDAR <clears throat> to, to generate the, the uh, elevations at a higher resolution as opposed to the SRM. With GIS, it's not restricted to terrain and off-road areas. They're, they're, you sometimes become interested in, in cities. And with that said, there, there are vector files that exist for cities in ArcGIS and other GIS. It, what you'll find is when you pull them up, the attribution is is there. It'll tell you uh, it's it's there, but it's not populated. So there'll be an attribution for a sidewalk here, but it won't tell you the width of the sidewalk. And and therefore, to do this study here, we had to go in and, and physically attribute put attributes down for the width of the sidewalk, width of the roads, the distance of, that these overhangs existed. In this particular study, we used the shadows of the telephone poles to, to back off where we thought these lines were and, and the restrictions. It became a real issue for a lot of vehicles driving down these roads in Europe. These overhanging uh, power lines would take out their antennas and other things. So we could attribute that. It was um, a little bit time consuming. Another study that uh, we did when I was at the core is, is uh, looked at routes between two points. And and often the, um, the, the issue was you had a Ford supplier and a Ford operating base. Often these are as much as 200 miles apart. That four-hour drive or eight-hour drive, particularly if the weather conditions change, would cause you to cross ditches. So you could generate a watershed model and look at movement of water in these areas, calculate the velocity of the water, the depth of the water. Then using a higher resolution model, we used uh, v four in this case, we would look to see if the vehicle could actually cross the the river, and if it couldn't, we would give a reason code, and, and from that we could regenerate a speed map indicating which routes were open for access between the forward operating base and forward supply area, and which reasons would cause the vehicles to stop or slow down. Another study we did was had some success. This is still at the core, is, is uh, looking at the collapse of, of low volume roads because we were running very heavy vehicles over them. Often they were armored and weighing up to 60 to 100,000 pounds. As these roads would collapse, it, it, it would cause um, concerns, you know, and, and, and often uh, kill the people inside. So, so we were able to look at using a slope and embankments approach, look at the failure of the roads and determine which ones would, would fail. To do this, we had to use high resolution LIDAR mapped in a GIS system, and then you do some computations based upon the level of water on the sides of the road to determine the, uh, it's called a slice method in, in civil engineering where the, where the roads would become unstable and collapse. Kind of wrapping this up, there's, there's some future areas and, and they were coming to the surface in, 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 in uh, 2000 and 2005, 10, was subsurface modeling, uh, trying to map tunnels, location of utilities, things of that nature. Uh, we were, were looking at how, how to map these, and it's very similar to the surface mapping for GIS. Now you have to add another dimension for the depth uh, below the surface. And also one of the more interesting areas I've, I've, I've seen recently is they're actually selling parcels of land in the metaverse now. And 
these are going for a good bit of money. Uh, and so you can, there are GIS systems they're using to build these and also build buildings in them and then sell the parcels of land for the commercial sector within the metaverse. And, and the one in the bottom is, uh, is, um, is, is uh, some of the um, uh, gaming software that's using it now for movement rates of vehicles. That's World of Tanks. But um, interesting uh, off, offset to, to gaming and and, um, and metaverse. I I will say that the GIS has uh, quite a few uses beyond what I've just mentioned. There's just uh, some that I've run into and, and issues I've run in into over the years I've worked with it. Uh, I'll field some questions at this point. I've taken up my 30 minutes and I'll see if there's any questions on the area. Okay, George, thank you very much for the presentation. You've, uh, you've done a really, <laughs> an excellent work in sticking uh, to, to your, to your schedule. You're, you're even earlier than, than anticipated. So I guess we will have, we will have more time for for the discussion. So I, as I said in the in the intro for today's event, I uh, invite uh, everyone to to join us here on stage to to participate live in in the conversation. So there's the blue the blue uh, share audio and video button on on the top right corner to do that, and you will be admitted by by a moderator and of course if instead you uh, you don't feel like uh, jumping jumping on stage then you can keep uh, posting your uh, your question uh, in the Q&A tab so while uh, uh, while we hopefully wait for uh, for someone to to join us here I'll start by uh, by reading the first the first question we have in queue in the in the Q and A section, so this the first one comes from. Oops, I saw something appear and disappear from my queue. Okay, so uh, I was reading the question. <laughs> going to read the question from George. Uh, sorry, from Henry Henry Hodges, and the question is George in the historical use of the terrain data um, for each polygon, was it possible to assess the performance of the vehicle for all paths that might be selected? Uh, yes. I mean, the, the quick answer to that is yes. Uh, uh, it, and it, you know, it depends on the model and, and how you're generating uh, the output from the terrain data, but when you when you create tens, you you basically have a plane, and and now from that plane you can generate multiple slopes and define up, down, and level. In the case of NRMM, that's what their traverse model does. Is when you define two points on the map, it goes to each polygon and selects the slope that is relative to the direction of that path, and computes the speed for the traverse. So in NRMM, the methodology there is to generate all speeds relative to the various slopes for each polygon, and then use a post-processor for de defining the traverse between those two points. Um, of course, nowadays with MAVs and, and some of the real-time software, they, they are going between two points and they already know their path and their, their slope. So they, they don't generate multiple paths as, as much. Uh, I, I guess I answered that question. Um, I, I, I can walk down this since I, I see an anonymous where how easily is, is it, can you use drones to collect images and stitch them together through digital image correlation is this method currently used. Um, 
answer, of course, is yes. Um, DIC is is uh, the use of two or more cameras. I guess you could do it with one to to create uh, using radial distortion to create an elevation grid. And so, if you have a drone, you simply I say you simply you put two cameras like you do on an airplane. Well, an airplane will okay. <laughs> you can do it with one camera that could trick and you just fly this path twice and, and you offset the path slightly. And that's exactly what they did in World War II and and, and uh, even up to present. So uh, digital image correlation usually implies you're using multiple images whether you're taken from the same camera or multiple cameras. And the the interesting and this is being used, it, it's uh, it's kind of tough to keep up with the location of the drone, you usually have a, a GPS on there, but it has to be really accurate to resolve the multiple images. But the answer to the question here is it's being done, it's not only being done with visible imagery, but it's being done with uh, infrared and, and other sources of imagery. And and this is fairly interesting in it. And sometimes you can take it with various times and, and look at um, things that stand out. If you're trying to pick up a mine, mine, you want to look early in the mornings when the variations in moisture are significant, and you use dim, di, digital image correlation with temporal variations to, to assess where um, the disturbed Earth is located. I, I guess I answered that question. Um, I see one from Alex Kane following the above question. How much? Are oh, George. George, we have we have Alex uh, live live with us, so I guess uh, we will have him let him ask him ask it for himself. Thank you, Alex, for joining us. Oh, Alex, you are you are muted, I think. Uh, is that better? Yep, better. Yeah, please please go ahead. Yeah, hello, George. Yeah, hello, Massimo. Uh, some interesting stuff here. Um, uh, uh, George, and looking at the questions, there seem to be two or three around drones. What, what I was quite interested in, obviously, this is a, a very useful planning tool and uh, working out what sort of needs, what, what, what you can do. Um, one of the things, obviously, with using drones, you'll get, you can collect real-time data. How much correction, I don't know if you've looked at this or any of anyone else on uh, who's, who's listening has, how much, how accurate is the data that you can collect from the databases and how much correction are you likely to need from uh, particularly collecting uh, drone data in front of vehicles uh, and the follow-up to that is what sort of attributes can you collect with drones that you can't get from the databases or are they all sort of mutually in the same area Boy, some of that I know an answer to, and some of it I don't. <laughs> Just to be honest, uh, so so it, uh, calibration and is a tough one. I, I don't know if I have a good answer for that, but uh, and particularly if you're trying to do it real time, uh, the, the the best way of doing that I think is with some sort of state space filter, or common filter, where you can readjust the error that you determine now how you determine that area is error is what you what are you trying to locate um let's get up okay so so maybe you're trying to find a buried mine in the road and you fly over it at multiple intervals you see a variation in moisture for from an area that you think you have right. a buried mine and you get there and it's it's a false positive you sh sh if you have a recursive filter or some sort of common filter in the algorithm you can train it to overlook those buried mines and and get rid of the false positives but um i think what you're talking about there is false positives and that's really a a, a tough area uh, the other question, you had two questions on that. What was the second? Yeah, the, the, the first one was really how, how close you can actually get to the sort of uh, 
field conditions from the databases and how much correction you would probably look for in either drones or autonomous vehicles, light autonomous vehicles. Uh, as as you, the example you had there of, of, of looking for um, uh, devices, explosive devices and so on, I suppose autonomous vehicles might uh, be useful there, but then drones can sort of land and, and collect more data and, and do various things. Uh, and the second, um, I'm just looking at see. Oh, and the, the range of attributes. Um, I, I, I'm thinking back uh, at Kyoto, there was, I think it was Professor uh, Tatiyama, they had some papers looking at using drones in sort of areas where you couldn't actually take vehicles in to look at the, the sort of uh, uh, the attributes, but you could take a, a, a drone in, particularly where you'd had disasters and so on. Uh, and it seems to me that you can collect so much data from the databases, but um, there are pres presumably there are an extra set of attributes you can collect from uh, uh, drones or from uh, autonomous vehicles or vehicles that can actually land and then actually take samples. Um, I suppose a little bit of crossover there with with uh, planetary vehicles collecting collecting data in on, on planets and so on. But um, it is that. Is there a limit to how much you can collect from the databases, which you really then have to switch over to uh, drones or autonomous vehicles? I don't think there's a limit. Um, the more data you have, the better off you are. Um, there, there is an argument, and I'm going to drift off the topic, which I'm good about doing, there's an argument of empiricism versus physics-based modeling. And I think this actually suggests lump parameter solutions for empirical. But as you, as you have less and less data, you have to make some, the, the uncertainty becomes greater and greater. And, and you have to take the, you have to bound the problem. It's harder to bound the problem. So it depends on what you're trying to do at, at what resolution data you need to, to support a good decision. Um, if, it's, if it's elevation data, then you, you, you have to look at the size of the vehicle and where it's being deployed and, and, and those factors. Um, certainly, one meter data is, is really nice if you have a vehicle that's five meters long. But um, most data comes in 30 meter, unless you have LIDAR. Um, if, if I can, there, there's a question um, that has to do with drones to maps, and, and we find that LIDAR is quicker. Um, oh, she's asking for real time. I, that, that, um, that's an interesting question question lidar is 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 a good source of measurement actually tesla's fighting this battle right now they're using multiple cameras on a vehicle as opposed to lidar and there's an argument that lidar is better in detecting objects and, and gives you a quicker response so that's a literally a million if not a billion dollar question i think using a combination of lidar and cameras is is the real good approach but certainly we use a good bit of lidar here to to get elevation data um and and we use cameras too uh, in the radio yeah. distortion are, that, are those cameras on the vehicle george or are they actually cameras on the on the drone uh, both uh, both um and and so we have um and, and that's certainly tesla is is using cameras on their vehicles I think they, I don't think they use LIDAR, and, and um, I think that's one of the arguments they were running into is the cameras sometimes will miss things that the LIDAR are quicker to pick up and respond to. There's a basic problem with, with LIDAR, it um, tends, tends to be moving, uh, rotating uh, uh, system, and you're getting back a reflection and, and a distance to an object, but 
it, it's it's you end it up with a cloud, a lot of points, uh, 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 and but you can argue you have the same thing with a camera and, and, and a DIC digital image correlation. Um, that's just that's just a good research area, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I, I guess that's another topic that somebody could talk to for an hour or two on the lighter versus uh, drone. But then, I, then I answer all your questions. Uh, yeah, I think so. There's a, I see there's a few more there now, George. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll leave you over to the uh, to the ones following up. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, uh, quickly, Andre. Um, I'll I'll try to. Uh, answer your question. When we did that study, we actually hauled dirt back from Afghanistan. We mixed it up so that it looked exactly like the dirt we got from Afghanistan. It had the same sand, clay, um, and, and had very similar properties. We had a, um, uh, and we rebuilt a road in the laboratory and ran an MRAP on it and had it collapse under the MRAP so that we had a re-replicated what was going on out in the field? Um, determine assign shear strength. That's how we assign the properties. Is is actually recreating it back in the laboratory, um, and we did do some estimates. But what we found too is that the levees would hold up pretty doggone good until they became flooded and, and as the water creeped up to the edge of the levee, it, it would saturate the surface and then cause um, the positive pore pressures and all that and cause a, a collapse. Does that, does that answer your question, Andre? Yes, sir. Thank you. And oh. good to see you. Oh, it's good seeing you, man. Where are you? Where are you, at? Are you in the Middle East now or are you in China? Where are you located? No, I'm back home. I have to give my laundry in the background. No, okay, okay. Well, it's good seeing you. Uh, Y'all got another trip out to Australia planned? Uh, not right now, but we're still engaged in PACOM quite a bit. So other other areas in PACOM. Okay. Not Australia at this point. Are, are you going to make it out to um, uh, Romania with NATO? You don't know? Romania? No, Germany. Uh, Germany. Is the one possibly. I'm not sure I can make it there. I will okay. try. Good luck. I'm tr I'm still trying. I'm I'm working out some some details as we talk. But I, I answered your question on the embankment. Yes, that's good. Thank you. I was just curious. We had a a real sharp fellow from uh, Puerto Rico come in, a soil sky, and, and between me and him, we did use digital image correlation. We actually put ping pong balls on the side of the levee and used two cameras using non proprietary software to to measure the displacement of the levee as the vehicle was driving over it and we tried to cross correlate that to a, a slice method we use for the for the um, slopes and embankments problem there's some more advanced systems to do that but uh, software but we use a real simple uh, slice method and assigned uh, C and fee until we got similar results yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I'm sure it's good. Thanks, George. All right. Thank you, man. Uh, I see another one from Henry. Uh, George, with regard. Oh, yeah. To so, sorry, George. Um, Henry, Henry is here with us live, so maybe we can have him uh, ask the question. Please, please, Henry. Th thanks for joining us. Yeah. Good. Good morning, George. Thanks for doing all this, man. This is just great. Um, hey, I, I was curious about uh, how you're dealing with uh, subsurface moisture. Uh, and since Andre's on the phone, you know, have you have you been able to use hyperspectral, or have you been able, or is, you know, how are you, how are, you know, that's the challenge that we all face. And um, so I was curious in this process how you were able to do that. But before you answer, I have to tell you, George, the whole ping pong ball solution. I remember, um, you know, that's the value of, I guess, of being around so long. Uh, just about 35, 40 years ago, we were using a very similar method with our dear friends from Krell in the snow, where we were, you know, using, you know, basically taking dye 
and you know having putting the dye down into the snow and then driving the vehicle across and then you know um you know making similar measurements so my only concern george is that after 35 years you know we all say that progress you know in civil engineering is somewhat glacial and um you know i'm hopeful that through your efforts that uh you know from a technology standpoint that that this will all substantially uh substantially improve so anyway but getting back to the question subsurface moisture thank you so we just finished a study for amg i can talk in generalities on it we were looking at modal analysis on the hood and tailgate and to do that we draw we drew dots all over the hood and tailgate and did dic on that and and picked up uh, we beat on it to pick up the different harmonic frequencies to see if it would shake when the vehicle was driving around so uh dic is used a good bit uh, you know, we could have used LIDAR to do the same thing, but the, the LIDAR is it's usually a point measurement that is scanned. And with the DSC, we could look at the whole thing at a, at a point. Now, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we the time difference between scanning and the entire hood would have caused a difference in modal analysis. Now that I'm totally off the question, uh, back to the question, uh, and, and Andre can correct me on this, but uh, the, 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 the method they've been using, I've seen, and, and University of Colorado did a good, Andy out of uh, Colorado uh, 4D, they, they look at um, variations in moisture content on the surface with time to back out what they think the moisture content on the subsurface is. And if you have a soil moisture model and you have evaporation rate, wind speed, and some other things, and, and weather conditions, you you can back out the subsurface moisture. If if you look at that snap, if you if you get a chance to go to Worldview or uh, it, it it snap does give a subsurface soil moisture, and I think that's where they're getting it is through um, uh, uh, backing it out based upon what they're seeing on the variations on the surface. Um, otherwise, the radar and 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 the um, the passive and, uh, and the passive uses uh, one gigahertz. It, 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 it's um, it's only on the surface, you know, the top few centimeters. And so there's no, uh, to my knowledge, there's no uh, uh, imagery that will get you that subsurface moisture. You have to back it out um, by observations of the surface. Uh, Andre, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Does that sound correct to you? No, that, that sounds good, George. The one gigahertz really is a bit too high of a frequency to go subsurface much, as you said. Um, yeah, so we actually have a system that goes way lower than that, an octave or so lower, and uh, that, that's where you can start getting penetration. As far as uh, SMAP, yes, that's exactly how they do it, George, as you said. Uh, the only issue there is uh, it works pretty well, but on a larger averaged uh, scale or sense. And so the smaller variations on a scale of meter or meters, um, it's very difficult to do using that technique. Uh, you, you can't get that resolution from uh, you know, atmospheric conditions and wind speed and atmospheric moisture and all those things. And so it, it works okay for SMAP scales. Uh, it, it's really hard to scale that um, down to higher resolution. Okay, so they're using a, a, a VLF, maybe a, a, not that low resolution, but all right. Um, there was something using gamma gamma rays, but I'm, I even think that was surface moisture. Um, I'll think of it. Yeah, I'm thinking Troxler maybe, the ground device. Gamma ray it has a cesium source, I think, and uh, I think it's dual alpha and gamma particles. One gives you density, the other is moisture content, but that's a contact measure. Yeah, but there was a study done by ARL about five to ten years ago where they were using, um, gosh, you know, my mind's gone, I'm this old age getting to me, but they, they would use a long probe that they hang, hung off the back of a truck and they were driving, they actually did the study in Hawaii of all places and they, it would pick up gamma radiations from the surface and cross correlate that to soil moisture 
Now, I don't think I don't think it was subsurface. I think it was surface. And, and the gamma radiation was only good for a certain distance above the ground, 50, 50 feet or so. So if you had a drone flying and could carry the system, you might have a chance. There was also some work with um, GPS. Um, the delay in the signal was from the, from GPS was trying to they were trying to get it cross correlated to soil moisture variations. I, I don't know how successful they were with that. But the subsurface is is a is a, is a good research issue, Henry. You, you brought up a point. Even even if we can get it indirect, it, it becomes very low resolution. Uh, a, a large spatial increment. Um, so so I'm I'm looking down the questions, making sure I, I, I've hit on most of them. Have you have you delved into the use of machine learning or AI to mine the data sets to find interesting information that would otherwise be difficult to obtain? We used the fuzzy neural net in early 90s. It was published in ANA. Uh, which is Artificial Neural Networks in Engineering. It's an IEEE publication. We were using Landsat imagery at that time. That's the one I was talking about where we would pull off roads based upon variation in Landsat imagery and, and redefine them. There's always studies being done with AI that, that would, uh, but in, in this case, uh, I th that's, that's where we, and we were using the Landsat imagery uh, uh, Landsat imagery data sets to, to work with and, and use XV. Um, so I guess I answered that question. Uh, there's, there's a lot of a lot of fascinating areas that can be used in GIS. Um, so so uh, uh, how easy is it to use drones, collect images, stitch them together? We answer that. I, th I think I. Um, yeah, I think George, you answered all questions and. You, you even did my job for me. So you, you read the question and you answered them. So, <laughs> Well, Henry's got one last question. He's <laughs> pumping them out. So in the sake of, in, in, at, at the start of the presentation, you mentioned that NRMM is a part of the high-speed computation effort. Is there a future to move over to the new? <laughs> oh, yeah, Henry, you know there is. I, I You know, they're looking for low-hanging fruit i think both efforts are and and i think the folks working nrmm legacy or 2.90 which is now matt now they've made some significant progress they've created xml format for the input files which are easily readable and, and give you details of information but they're also looking over the fence to see what's going on with nrmm NG and see if there's a way to merge the two systems. Um, it, it's they they they're smart enough to know there's there's other smart people in the room and they can't do it all. Um, and so there's some opportunities there to to work with the core and transfer um, findings over to the core. They they would fund the efforts so, and our it, it, they need to be out there in Germany um, to, 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 to watch what's going on. I, I believe there was a good there was a good showing from the feds at, at KRC. So, so, so the U.S. is um, is really interested in what's going on with the NG, and they try to keep abreast of it. Um, I, how they're how they're coordinating that effort is, I hate to say, it's beyond my pay grade. I like I'm like you, Henry. I get paid way too much, so I, I hate to say anything about my pay grade. But um, if they really have some different political things going on to ensure that everybody's happy and are unhappy, depending on what they're trying to do. Uh, did that answer your question, Henry? Yeah, George, it did. I I just um, you know honestly, uh, you know being part of that whole um, NATO next generation NRMM for whatever it is, seven years now, um, you know, that I'm, I'm so glad you answered it that way because, uh, you know, early days, Wendell Gray was there and other, other folks were there. And then, um, and then, 
uh, you know, circumstances, um, uh, they, they weren't able to participate. So, um, so hopefully, hopefully, you know, Trier will happen and, uh, you know, COVID will die down and, and vehicles will run and, and those demonstrations, I, I think the expectation from those demonstrations is really to go, you know, kind of beyond what happened at KRC and, and that level of fidelity, um, you know, uh, David, who's on this phone call and others are involved in, uh, um, you know, the upgrade for the ride quality assessment and Andre, I, I'm pretty sure is on the agenda. Um, and so he'll be talking and so, yeah, it should be a, a good, uh, good, uh, you know, assuming it actually happens, um, hopefully it'll be well attended and, and it'll set the stage for, kind of those next steps of implementation that we've all been, you know, talking, working on and, and honestly talking about for the last couple of years. But as, as always, George, you are just, you're my hero. It's, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. So thanks so much for everything you've been sharing in this and, and for being the true gray beard, um, you know, that can look back and say, Hey, here's where we were. And here's what we learned recently, and here's what we're getting to work. I think that's just outstanding. So thank you for that, George. Well, it's always good hearing from you, Henry. Um, tell 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 the family back there that <laughs> well, I miss them. <laughs> I'll make it out your way before it's over. Uh, I enjoy trips out there. Yeah, and, thanks, man. NAT's got a nice test facility. Um, so I, I believe I've covered all the questions. Um, you know, this LIDAR versus DIC, I'll go mention it, go back to it one last time and say it depends on what you're trying to do and, and make sure you have the right tool for it. So it's it's kind of a, a question of which tool do you need and, and, and how do you need to use it? Um, I've used both. And I think the solution for Tesla may be to use both. Um, that lidars are getting real cheap along with the radar, so so and they're, and they're very easy to use and and assess the data from. Um, that's all. Um, uh, yeah. Thank George. you. Thank, thank you, everybody, for your time. I appreciate you tuning in. It's been a great pleasure to sit up here and talk. Yeah, George. I would like to to thank you for sharing your valuable experience with us and for having for making this nice presentation and getting this uh, nice conversation uh, started so i think we had a very uh, successful event uh, also today as we we've had uh, in the past events of the series so uh, thanks again george for your presentation and uh Getting uh, wrapping this up, I would like to to thank all the staff at ISTVS that's making this possible, and of course uh, everyone in attendance uh, today. And um, I would just like to, uh, to take a minute to invite all graduate students uh, and research professionals out there to consider uh, being our next speakers for the student research seminars and for the Terra Mechanics Bytes. And also uh, graduate students are uh, invited to join the ISTVS research uh, initiatives, uh, initiative, sorry. Uh, you can see uh, the relevant, the relevant uh, links uh, on my screen right now. And finally, uh, if you haven't already done it, uh, please, renew your ISTVS uh, membership for 2022 now. The membership renewal campaign has already started and, and you can renew now. So yeah, uh, unless uh, Georgia has uh, some final remark, I think it's everything on my side. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's, it's been a pleasure once again talking to everybody. Hope this helps. Get a chance to go out there to Worldview and look at the uh, data sets that are available. I, uh, they're for, for an unclassified um, 
non-FOUO, it's, it's, it's really a good site to download data and look at and process results. Um, thank you. Thank you for, very much for your time. And I guess I'll be signing off. Okay. Thanks, George. Thanks, everyone. And have a good afternoon or, or evening, depending on where you are. Goodbye.